All right, we are going to be moving on to chapter 23b, the male reproductive system. So this is the second half of chapter 23. All righty. So basically, the, both the male and the female reproductive system have, serve the same function. All right. Oops, my computer's giving me notes. Basically, the function is to produce uh, gametes, which in the male would be sperm. All right, in the female are ova. We already talked about that. All right, here we have sperm in the males. So just so you know, this symbol is for male. This symbol is for female, okay? So I usually do this. If you take bio nine with me, genetics, I use male and female like that a lot. But basically the idea is that the reproductive system is going to be producing uh, the producing and allowing the development of mature gametes, sperm and ova, and fertilization, development, and hopefully the health, healthy birth of an offspring. To do this, sex hormones play a huge role, okay? Sex hormones in males and females allow the development of what we call secondary sexual characteristics. And so usually, um, these are linked with reproductive activities. So like the mammary glands in females, um, secondary sexual characteristics that are typical of males would be uh, the dissension of the testes during, uh, well, young development, uh, the, the uh, development of facial hair and so forth. These promote uh, normal reproductive system activity, uh, sex hormones that is, uh, and some to some degree, the uh, secondary sexual characteristics as well. All right, so let's go through all the main uh, portions of the male reproductive system. In Bio 16 at Merced College, we do have extra vocabulary and extra things to identify, like the ligaments that help suspend erectile tissue in the appropriate place and so forth. But in Bio 50, we don't have to cover that yet. So let's start here at the top. So the urinary bladder sits superior to the male reproductive system, which is down here. The urinary bladder, of course, has the ureter associated with it. So here's a ureter feeding the urinary bladder. Now, what's important about the urinary bladder, both in the male and female reproductive system, is that it's really close to the reproductive system. So both males and females um, have a link to reproductive system um, localization, or where it is in the body, and the uh, uh, urinary system. Now in males, the male reproductive system shares two jobs. Number one, obviously reproductive function, but number two, the production and elimination of urine. So males do two things with the reproductive system, all right, whereas females, we, well, we just basically do reproduction. So I am trying to get my eraser to behave and it's not, if you can believe it, my finger's too big for this right now. There we go. All right, the body cavity right here, this would be what body cavity? Do you guys remember? This would be the abdominal pelvic body cavity. In fact, you're way down here in the pelvic portion. The erectile tissue is external in the body. However, it does extend inwards um, and there are ligaments associated with it that you don't have to worry about right now. We'll talk about erectile tissue in greater detail later on in this lecture. The urethra, which is the exit for the urinary system. The glands penis is just this region on the exterior of the penis, all right? Well, it's not even on the exterior, it extends in, inwards too. We'll talk about glands penis in a little bit. The scrotum is just the skin surrounding the testes, which is where sperm are formed. The epididymis is, believe it or not, about uh, it's a long skinny coiled tube that's about, oh, six meters or 20 feet in length, all right? It's really long. It just looks like one little line here, but it's a little tube that zigzags back and forth and back and forth uh, for about 20 feet. In the epididymis, the new sperm are uh, transported to the epididymis where they develop and uh, basically the sperm tail develops in the epididymis. The joke that I know, well, I, I have a lot of male cousins and I do a lot of, like, all kinds of things like Taekwondo and the joke is the epididymis is a sperm boot camp. That's where they go to develop and become mature. Okay, um, the vas deferens connects the epididymis up to uh, the region where the uh, sperm, where semen's gonna be formed and the sperm are ejected. So the vas deferens extends upwards over by the urinary bladder, may or may not circle behind the, the um, 
be a reader, so don't worry about that necessarily. The vas deferens connects to the seminal vesicle, which is this item right here. I should get a different color, right? Let's do green, I feel like Christmas, right? Uh, the seminal vesicle. The seminal vesicle produces fluids, we'll talk about that in a little bit, that helps nourish and fuel the sperm and form semen for its trip out uh, through the, the penis. So here's the seminal vesicle right here meeting the vas deferens and then we have the ejaculatory duct right here which isn't labeled you'll see that later though it flow it not doesn't flow but it, it uh, it's goes through the prostate gland the prostate gland also makes fluid that is important in the formation of semen we have the bulbo-urethral bulbo -urethral gland, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Again, that's also not labeled, but we'll get to that. And then you have, of course, the urethra. Behind all of this, or I guess I should say, posterior to the male reproductive system is the rectum, which is the end of the digestive system. Okay, so structurally, organs, um, again, like we saw in the female reproductive system, are classified as essential. You need them for reproduction or accessory, okay? So in terms of organs that are essential, of course the gonads or the testes are essential because the, that's what produces gametes, sperm. The accessory organs are the ducts, the passageways that carry the sperm away. The idea is that, you know, in theory, if, as long as the sperm get to where they get into contact with an ovum, the rest of its accessory. The sex glands, so we have ducts that's accessory, sex glands that produce uh, the nutrient solution for sperm, the, um, uh, oh, the kind of the sugar protein rich uh, solution uh, called semen. Well, it's the solution plus the sperm that makes semen. And then the external genitals. Those are also, believe it or not, considered accessory organs. So here's that picture we were looking at a minute ago. Again, there are a couple things missing here that, are la that aren't labeled, but we'll get to that, all right? So the testes right down here are uh, located inside of the scrotum. The scrotum is the piece of skin that holds, or kind of this, the pocket of skin that holds the testes. Males usually have two. I say usually because sometimes a male may only have one. Um, the testes are covered by a, tish, a tissue called the tunica abelgina. Um, the tunica abelgina, again, remember the tunics mean there are layers. This divides the testes into individual lobes containing what we call seminiferous tub tubules. So the tunica ab abelgina kind of separates the scrotum up into regions like this, all right? Within each region, the seminiferous tubule, which I'll make, well, no, that's purple. Let's get a different, let's do orange. Seminiferous tubules kind of zigzag around inside, all right? The seminiferous tubules are where meiosis happens. And remember, meiosis makes gametes. Interstitial cells in the testes produce the hormone testosterone, all right? And testosterone is very important for the development and maintenance of male secondary sexual characteristics. We'll talk about that a little bit farther in this uh, lecture. So, Going back to the, uh, the testes, what's made in there? Sperm. The process is called spermatogenesis, all right? And it produces sperm through a uh, meiotic cell division. So remember meiosis, you start with one cell. And this is just a basic example, okay? At the end of meiosis, there is the potential of having four individual cells, all right? So why do I say the potential? Well, remember in oogenesis, in the production of the ova, one of the first two cells wasn't, didn't survive, right? And we called that a polar body. So this whole trajectory right here was off the table genetically. And then after the second meiotic division, another one didn't survive. That's not the case. Let me erase that. Let me see if I can erase that. Oops. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to redraw this up above the sperm because I'm having trouble uh, with the little symbols down below. So after the first meiotic division, you have two cells that can divide again. And what's interesting about sperm is that sperm in spermatogenesis, you don't have the development of a polar body. 
all right? You end up with four potential outcomes that can develop into individual sperm. Now, is it more complicated in humans and other organisms? Yes, and when I say other organisms, I mean things like plants. Plants produce pollen. Pollen are the male gametes, basically the sperm of uh, angiosperms and gymnosperms, plants that do fertilization, okay? So pollen do not have as mature, well, they're very beautiful, but they're not mobile. They don't swim. The gametes don't swim. And so one of the things that's interesting about the male reproductive systems in humans is that the spermatogonia, which are super specialized, still maintain this uh, one to four ratio during meiosis, whereas the ova don't. The head contains the genetic material because the nucleus is in the head of the sperm. Okay, so here's the head. There's also the acrosomal cap and the nuclear membrane. The midpiece contains what's left of a centriel and a few mitochondria. Now, what's interesting here is that there aren't a lot of mitochondria, and in some sperm, actually don't have any mitochondria at all. If there are mitochondria, you're never going to find it in the head of the sperm. And there, are, that's a very important thing because as the egg is fertilized by the sperm, only the nucleus is pushed into the egg during fertilization, okay? I will try to see if I can find a good video of that, and I'm going to write it down because I always promise you a video and I always forget. So I'll do um, video fertilization. Okay, wrote it down. So the midpiece carries the mitochondria, but that midpiece never makes it into the fertilized zygote. Therefore, all of the mitochondria that we have in our body come from mom because the ovum has mitochondria. The last part of a, of a mature sperm is the tail, and the tail is made up of a flagella and then a long kind of squiggly part here that doesn't move. The flagella itself is what moves. This is just the the tail end. Um, the acrosome has lots of enzymes that allow the sperm to penetrate the outer layer of the ovum. And then, of course, the mitochondria provide energy for movement, but they never enter, hopefully, the egg. Every now and again, you will get a, a, a paternal, we call it paternal because it's from dad, mitochondria getting into a zygote. That does other things. Take my Bio9 class. We talk about that in there. It's actually really cool. All right. So, Male reproductive hormones, testosterone is the one that we recognize the most. And it is the hormone that produces masculine, masculinization in uh, young males. It promotes the development of the accessory organs, so the secondary sexual characteristics, the penis, um, facial hair, definitely stimulates anabolism. Anabolism is not cannibalism, folks, all right? Let's not go there. Anabolism is when a tissue grows. Think anabolic. What do you think of when you think of anabolic? Anabolic steroids. Testosterone is an anabolic steroid. Um, one of the things that uh, testosterone allows males to do is increase the amount of lean muscle mass. Therefore, they have increased muscular strength. Can a woman do this? Absolutely. However, Women who take anabolic steroids like testosterone or other steroids out there that metabolically will be turned into testosterone in a woman's body, because believe it or not, we have enzymes that'll do that. Uh, those women do develop tremendous muscle strength, uh, muscle mass, more like a man. However, there are other uh, issues that end up occurring, uh, like loss of a menstrual cycle, uh, heart defects, heart damage, uh, Anabolic steroids damage heart valves in both males and females. So stay away from them, folks. Stay off the juice. It's great to have tremendous muscle strength. It's not worth taking anabolic steroids to get there, though. Go natural. Lots of protein powder. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the reproductive ducts, which are considered accessory organs. The reproductive ducts include the epididymis, the vas deferens, uh, seminal vesicle, and so on. We'll get there in a little bit. Uh, the epididymis. Uh, they allow the sperm to uh, interface with the different fluids and mucus so that it can be ejected out of the body easily. We mentioned the epididymis earlier on. It's a single coiled long, long tube tucked uh, posterior to the main part of the testis, um, about six meters or 20, 21 feet in length. This is where the sperm mature. Remember sperm boot camp. Uh, and they increase their capacity to swim or to be modal. 
Uh, epididymitis is a painful, painful inflammation of the epididymis, and usually that happens as a result of mechanical damage. All right, I'll catch you on the next video.